This is ChestertonRadio.com. World's Great Novels. The National Broadcasting Company presents the first episode in its three-part dramatization of Charles Dickens' thrilling story of the French Revolution, a tale of two cities, another in its series of books that live the world's great novels. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of folly. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of doubt. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going straight the other way. It was the year of our Lord, 1,775. And in November of this year of 1775, the surface of life went on as usual. So, as usual, the heavy mail coach with its steaming horses made its slow way from London to discharge a single passenger, an orderly, methodical man of business, one Jarvis Laurie from Telson's Bank of London and Paris at the Royal George Hotel at Dover. Before I go to my room, let me say there will be a young lady asking for me, <coughs> Mr. Jarvis Laurie. When she comes... The young lady is here, sir. Already? Well, very good to be at once. Yes, sir. I will request her to come, sir. Now then, Laurie... Business, business. Remember, it is business. But 18 years. Buried alive for 18 years. How am I to tell her? Here is the young lady, sir. Uh, you may go. Okay. Thank you, sir. Miss Manette, I kiss your hand. Why sit down, sir? And you, miss. I received the letter from the bank. It is most kind of you to protect me on my journey to Paris. A pleasure, Miss Manette. Can you explain? The letter said something had been discovered about my poor father's property. His uh, property, yes. He had been dead so long. What is it about? It's rather difficult to begin. Mr. Laurie, are you quite a stranger to me? Am I not? I don't know. I sense it. But go on. Well, then, Miss Burnett... I should like to tell you the story of one of our customers. A story? Yes, about a doctor. He was from Beauvais. My father was a doctor from Beauvais? This doctor, I knew him in Paris. He was well known there. He dealt with my bank, with Telson's. When was this? Well, we see now, uh, 20 years ago. The doctor had a wife, an English lady. Mr. Laurie, I know you now. It was you who brought me to England after my mother died. I'm sure it was you. Yes. It was I, Miss Manette. Then this is... This must be my father's story. Until now, the other same. But now, Miss, if your father had not died, if he had been spirited away, uh, put in prison... What are you telling me? Uh, if this man had had a child... A daughter? A daughter... And if the doctor's wife had determined to spare her child any pain, had uh, raised her in the belief that her father was dead. The truth. I pray you, sir, the truth. This is what your mother did. She tried to find him. She tried endlessly until her heart broke. But she left you to grow up beautiful and happy. She spared you the pain. And now, the letter, what does it mean? Miss Burnett, your father has been found. Oh, my father is alive? He is alive. That is why we are going to Paris. Alive? My father... Please, Miss Bennett. I have been free. I have been happy. And he... You will make him happy now. You will bring him back to life and love and comfort. I have been free all these years. Why did he not haunt me? He goes. Mr. Laurie, I am going to see his ghost. It will be his ghost, not my father. Paris, 
where reign a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face. Paris, where one of the towers of Notre Dame looks down on the Grand Hotel of a Monseigneur, the preparation of whose morning chocolate requires the aid of four strong men, in addition to the cook. And where the other tower of Notre Dame looks toward the quarter of San Antoine, in the streets of which the spilling of a barrel of wine is enough to bring the human rats out of every corner. San Antoine, like all of France, has its own Monseigneurs. Cold, dirt, sickness, and want. All of them nobles of great power who abide fittingly in the narrow, stinking streets. On the corner of one stands a wine shop, whose proprietor holds nightly converse with his friends, while his wife, like all the women of San Antoine, sits with her knitting, keeping her fingers busy, that the stomach may be less sensible of its want of work, until the appearance of two newcomers causes the shop to empty quickly, and the proprietor shortly to leave also with his visitors. Here are the stairs. Begin slowly. The climb is long. Is the doctor alone, Monsieur Defarge? Alone. God help him, who should be with him? Is he always alone? Of necessity, Monsieur Laurie. When they brought him to me, they warned me at my peril to be discreet. We are most grateful to you. I was his servant through many years, Mademoiselle. If I can serve him Is still... Is he greatly changed? Changed? In the name of the devil, what do you expect? Perhaps he will have to stay a while until he gets stronger. He cannot. He must be gotten out of France at once. His life depends on it. Is it much farther? Only at the top of this flight. Oh. You have a key, monsieur. The door is locked. Aye, it is necessary. But why? Why? Because he was locked up so long, he'd tear himself to pieces if his door were left open. This is possible. Many things are possible. Many things are done every day under that sky. There long live the devil. Is it you, Jacques? It is I, Jacques. Who are these three men? Leave us, good boys. We have business here. Hey, Jacques. We have seen him. They were looking through the keyhole. You make a show, Monsieur Manette. To a chosen few. Is that well? I think it is well. I show him to men of my name, men named Jacques. This sight will do them good. Wait a moment. Why do you do that? This too is necessary. You in there? Why does he shout at him? Push, my dear. Come in. Come in. I am afraid. Come forward, mademoiselle. Yes. There is nothing to fear. What is he doing? What is that work? He's making shoes. All day from dawn to black dark, he's making shoes. You are still at work, I see. Yes, I am working. Are you going to finish that pair of shoes today? Uh, I suppose so. Oh, my God. Hush, my dear. You have a visitor. What did you say? Show Monsieur the shoe you are working at. Uh, may I take it? Tell Monsieur what kind of shoe it is. It is a lady's shoe. It is a lady's... Walking shoe. Tell Monsieur your name. Give me my shoe. Uh, what is your name, Shoemaker? My name. Yes. Uh, tell me your name. My name. Number 105 North Tower. What? 105 North Tower. 105 North Tower. <laughs> Thus is a man buried alive for 18 years, dug out and recalled to life. Slowly, with loving tenderness in the years that follow, did Lucie nurse her father back to health and refire the full vigor of his prison-dimmed mind. At the end of five years came a day that he will afterwards remember. A certain day in a courtroom. Dr. Minette, mm. you've heard the testimony against the prisoner, Charles Darnay? I have. You have heard Mr. John Barstead, the witness for the Crown, testify that the said Charles Darnay is a traitor to England by reason of certain documents he has delivered into the hands of the French government? Yes. You have heard your daughter, Miss Lucy Manette, testify that five years ago she met the accused aboard a packet ship which was bringing you from France. My daughter testified most unhappily, as her tears must have proved. It is not our wish to bound, Mr. Darnay. The court is not concerned with the manner of her testimony. Will you look upon the prisoner? You ever seen him before? Once. He called at my lodgings in London three years ago. You cannot identify him as your fellow passenger aboard the packet? I cannot, sir. Is there any special reason why you cannot? There is. You underwent a long imprisonment without trial in your native France, did you not, Dr. Minette? 
a very long imprisonment. On the occasion of your being aboard the packet five years ago, you were newly released? They tell me so. You do not remember? I remember nothing. From sometime during my confinement until I found myself living in London with my dear daughter, my mind is a blank. That will do, Dr. Minette. I wish to recall the Crown's estimable witness, Mr. John Barsad. John Barsad! John Barsad! Yes, sir. Mr. Barsad, you have declared that the servant of the prisoner discovered these traitorous documents in the prisoner's possession five years ago and reported them to you. He did his duty like I did mine. You are a courageous man. Now, you also declare that you saw the prisoner, Charles Darnay, take the mail coach for Dover shortly thereafter. I did. I only wish to impress your testimony on the court. Thank you, Mr. Barthard. You may stand up. Hold on a minute there. Huh? <laughs> Who is this man? I am an associate of the counsel for the defense. Sidney Cotton, at your service. <laughs> I wish to ask the witness if he is quite sure it was the prisoner he saw. Of course I'm sure. It was him and no other. Did you ever see anybody very like the prisoner? Not to be mistaken. I will take off my wig. Look well at me and then at the prisoner. Could you not mistake me for him? Wait, wait. Mr. Cotton, you are trying to confuse my witness. Huh? He's confused already. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the court... If what happens once may not happen twice, I asked the court if the witness would have been so confident had he seen me before. I asked the court whether it may not now try Sidney Cotton for treason as sensibly as Charles Darnay. <laughs> brought you off with honor, Mr. Darnay, in spite of that lying bastard. I am most grateful, Mr. Lafay. As for you, Monsieur Cotton, I owe you my life. A great debt to owe for a small accident. Can you forgive me, Mr. Darnay? Indeed, Miss Manette. I am sure your testimony did me more good than harm. Well, we must not stand here in the night fog. As a physician, will you not order us to our homes, Dr. Manette? What? What did you say? Mr. Lorry thinks we should go home, Father. You uh, look at me very strangely, Doctor. Is anything wrong? No, 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 not, nothing, Mr. Darnay. I thought for a moment that I knew your face, but there is nothing. Come away, Father. Yes, my dear. Good night, gentlemen. Good, Good night, night, Carter. Mr. Darnay, Good once night. again, Good my night. congratulations. Must be a strange night to you, Mr. Darnay, standing alone here in the street with your double. I hardly seem to belong to this world at all. I don't wonder. It's not so long since you were on your way to another. <laughs> you sound faint. I think I am. Then why don't you dine? My arm, my friend. I'll show you to the best bottle of wine in Fleet Street. Are you back in the world yet, Mr. Darnay? <laughs> I, I think so. As for me, I only want to forget I belong to it. There's no good in it for me except this wine. Here, let me pour for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Call a help, Mr. Darnay. Give your toast. Uh, what toast? Why, it's on the tip of your tongue. I'll swear it is. Miss Minette, then. Miss Manette, then. That's a fair young lady to be pitied by and have weep for you. Worth risking your life for, eh? You remind me, I have not thanked you enough for giving me back my life. Uh, I want no thanks. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Darnay. Willingly. Do you think I like you particularly? You act as if you do. But I don't think you do. And I don't think I do. I'm beginning to respect your understanding. Nevertheless, I hope I may call the reckoning and part kindly with you. You may. And if you call the whole reckoning, uh, order me another pint of this wine. I will. 
Uh, uh, last word, Mr. Darley. Do you think I'm drunk? I think you have been drinking. You know I've been drinking. I know it then. Then you shall know why. I'm a disappointed grudge, sir. A great lawyer gone wrong. The jackal at the lion's feast. I care for no man, and no man cares for me. You might have used your talents better. Mm, maybe so, Mr. Darnay. But don't think too much of your own sober face. You don't know what it may come to. I thank you for the advice, Mr. Cotton. Good night. Good night. More wine there. Good night, sober man. <laughs> Do I like you? Confound you, Cotton. Why should you like a man who resembles you? Much there is in you to like. Like a man who shows you what might have been? change places with him, and you'd have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was. Have that out in plain words, Cotton. You hate the fellow. living out in the country, this house. Is it not, Mr. Darnay? So is a magical corner of London, Mr. Loy. The more magical because the good doctor and uh, Miss Manette live here. I find it so, too. They should return soon. Have you seen the whole house? Yes. Uh, Mr. Loy, perhaps you can give me the answer to a question. Mm -hmm. I would try. In the doctor's bedroom, I have seen a shoemaker's bench and a tray of tools. Uh, why does he give them there? I wonder, too. Miss Lucy tells me that she hears him sometimes in the night, walking up and down like a man in a cell. But he never speaks. This looks like serious business for such a quiet day. Oh, come in, Mr. Cotton. I am in. Cotton? You are a mirror that sticks like a shadow, Mr. Darnay. I do not see a man all my life. Then, during four months, I see no one else. <laughs> I think I hear Miss Manette and the doctor. They may be quite far off still. This corner picks up all the echoes from three streets around. I've noticed it, too. Sometimes there seem to be a thousand footsteps here, and no one comes. They are here, yes. nonetheless. Lucy, I was sure we would have to Mr. Cotton, my dear doctor? friend, Gentleman. sit down. We shall have tea at once. Oh, thank you. Ah, you've come home in good time, Doctor. We shall have a storm, I think. No storms come into this house, Mr. Lorry. My Lucy keeps them out. <laughs> Where have you been walking? We have been out looking at some of the old buildings along Temple Bar. There is a storm, we were promised. Yes, in big drops. It comes slowly. It comes surely. The people are hurrying home in every street. A multitude of footsteps and not a soul to be seen. A, a multitude and yet a, a solitude. Sometimes I sat here and listened and thought those footsteps were all the people who are coming into our lives by and by. There is a great crowd coming, if that is so. Are they coming to all of us or only to you? It is only a fancy, Mr. Darnay, but I have thought into my life and my father's. I take them into mine. Have a care, Mr. Carton. Speak not so warmly of the mob. I accept them. I ask no questions. It is a great crowd, and I see them by the lightning. And I hear them. Come one, come all. Come fierce and come furious. The footsteps come, fierce and furious. And in the quarter of San Antoine, they herald another visitor, one who wants no part of a mob. San Antoine should be honored, but the honor is lost upon it. It runs away and pulls its children, when it can, from under the visitor's chariot wheels. What's that? What is the matter? Why do we stop? An accident, Monseigneur. The coachman has got down. Well, get him up again. What has gone wrong out there? Oh, no, Monsieur Le Marquis. Yes. It is a child. The yes. horse trod upon it. <laughs> that man, why does he make that abominable noise? Is it his child? Excuse me, Monsieur Le Marquis. It is a pity, yes. <laughs> My child. Mon pauvre enfant, Monsieur. 
still. <laughs> He's dead. It is extraordinary to me that you people cannot take care of yourselves and your children. Mon petit. One or the other of you is forever in the way. How do I know what you have done to my horses? <laughs> there. There is a gold piece. <laughs> Enough of this noise. He's dead. He's dead. Be a brave man, my friend. It is better so. He has died in a moment without pain. He could not have lived an hour in Napoli. Ah, you are a philosopher, you there. How do they call you? They call me Defarge. Of what trade? Monsieur le Marquis, vendor of wine. Ah, oh, there is gold for you too, vendor of wine. Pick it up and spend it as you will. The horses there, are they all right? Oui, Monseigneur. Drive on. There is your money, dog. Hold. Hold the horses. Who threw that coin? Where is that man? You there, woman. You with the knitting. You stood near him. Ah, you dogs. I would ride over every one of you and exterminate you from the earth. Drive on there. To the chateau. nephew, Monsieur Charles. Is he arrived from England? He is within, Monsieur le Marquis. Good evening, Charles. Or shall I say Monsieur Danet? That is your name now, eh? Good evening, sir. I would have been here to receive you. There was an inconvenience in the village. Not a great one, I trust. Not as great as I'm sure you do trust, my dear nephew. As we drew up to the posting house gate, I noticed the people staring at my coach. Uh, there was one, a man of roads. He told a strange tale of a man who had been clinging to a chain beneath the coach and who dropped off at the top of the hill and disappeared. Clinging to a chain? <laughs> it is likely the road mender invented the tale to get gold. <laughs> These lying dogs... You will not search for the men then? Oh, to what purpose? You have been a long time coming, Charles. But I am back now for my old purpose. Though it may carry me to death. Oh, that is not necessary, Charles. Not to death. But you would not pull me back from the drink. I am sure your diplomacy will stop at no means to prevent me from attaining my purpose. Please recall that I told you so long ago. I recall it. Oh, thank you. What was that? Huh? Where? Outside the blinds. Open them. I see nothing. Well, then. You were thinking of the man under the coat? I was thinking of nothing. You were saying... I was saying that it is a good thing for me that you have no longer the king's ear and could not have me thrown into prison. It is not a good thing, Charles. These um, a gentle aids to the honor of families are too difficult to obtain now. It used not to be so. Once we could assert our station properly. We've asserted our station enough to make Embremont the most detested name in France. Ah, let us hope it is so. It is a compliment. We have done wrong, sir. We are reaping the fruits of wrong. We? Our family. Our honorable family. We've injured every human creature who stood between us and our pleasure. And why not, my friend? In your father's time... It is your time, too. Nothing can separate you. Ah, death has done that. And has left me trying to undo some of the wrongs of the dead. You dishonor the dead. My father, not my mother. With her last word, she begged me to have mercy, to redress... And now I spend my life seeking power and assistance in vain. You will seek them forever in vain if you seek them from me. You would do better to be rational and accept your destiny. But you are lost, I see, Monsieur Charles. This property in France are lost to me. I renounce them. This property is not yours to renounce. Not yet. But when it is, I shall abandon it. It is a wilderness of misery and ruin. There is a curse on this land. Ah, you prefer England, uh, for example? Yes, England. 
where I bring no disgrace to the family, nor it to me. Hmm. England is very attractive to you, seeing how badly you have prospered there. I can thank you for my prospering there. I know who paid Bassad to accuse me. But England is my refuge. I'm the refuge of many. You know another Frenchman who has found refuge there? A doctor? Yes. With a daughter? Yes. Yes. So commences the new philosophy. Oh, you must be fatigued, Monsieur Danay. I will have your chamber lighted. Good repose. are upon everything. Upon the marquee, within the gauze curtains that enfold his bed. Upon the carved stone faces that stare from under the eaves of the chateau. Upon the fountain dropping unseen and unheard. Upon the people of the village asleep and dreaming of ease and banquets. Upon San Antoine far away. Upon all France. And when the night has passed and the routine of life is astir again, all things are as usual. All things? Then what news is it that the birds carry over the fields so that the mender of roads on the sultry morning runs down the hill knee-high in dust? What news that the toxin rings above the carved stone faces that show no surprise? Mr. Charles! Mr. Charles! Yes? What is it, man? Speak! Quickly, Mr. Charles! Come quickly! Monseigneur! Monseigneur! I found him so, monsieur. A knife. Three half. So, uncle, stone faces have a new companion. Uh, what is that paper on the knife? Drive him fast to his tomb. This from a man called Jacques. <laughs> The footsteps have come into the chamber. The footsteps carrying the knife into lives as yet untouched by its bite. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens is one of the world's great novels brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company. Listen next week to the second episode of A Tale of Two Cities. And don't forget that your local public library can be the source of great entertainment. To enhance your enjoyment of this series, we recommend the Handbook of the World's Great Novels, which you may obtain by sending 25 cents to World's Great Novels, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. That's Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27. Tale of Two Cities is adapted for radio by Clarice A. Ross. The music was composed by Dick Shores, and the orchestra was directed by Bernard Berquist. The entire production was under the direction of Homer Heck. Geraldine Kay is featured as Lucy, and Jonathan Hall as Sidney Cotton. The narration is by Sherman Marks. Charles Darnay is played by Ken Nordine, Dr. Manette by Maurice Copeland, Jarvis Laurie by Jess Pugh, Defarge by Ken Griffin, The Marquis by Sid Breeze. The Lawyer by George Kluge and Barsad by Ted Liss. This is John Conrad. This program comes to you from Chicago and is a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent station. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. You're listening to Chesterton Radio at chestertonradio.com. The world's great novel. The National Broadcasting Company presents the second episode in its four-part dramatization of Charles Dickens' powerful story of innocent lives, pitted against the forces of fury, a tale of two cities. 
another in a series of books that live the world's great novel. After 18 years' imprisonment in the Bastille, Dr. Alexander Manette has been rescued and taken to England by his daughter Lucy and their old friend Jarvis Laurie. The charm of their quiet life is shared by Charles Darnay, a young Frenchman, and Sidney Carton, a brilliant but dissipated lawyer. Between Darnay and Carton, there is an uncanny physical resemblance. But meanwhile, across the channel, the fury of a chained people gathers strength, and the first to bow to it is the Marquis saint devremont of the family of which Charles Darnay is a member, but which he has renounced forever. A year has passed since the mysterious death by stabbing of the Marquis and the return of Charles Darnay from France. A year in which he has prospered and been happy, keeping ever in his heart and before his eyes the image of one dear face. But of his love for Lucie Manette, he has spoken no word until, on a summer day, he seeks out her father in the quiet house in Soho. I'm glad to see you, Mr. Darnay. Thank you. Uh, Miss Manette is well? Quite well. She is up shopping with our good Miss Brown. I'm glad she's away, Doctor. I uh, wanted to talk to you about Lucy. I've known your daughter for a year and a half, sir. I've held her in the deepest respect. It is painful for me to hear her spoken of in that tone. A tone of great love and admiration, Doctor. I believe you. Shall I go on, sir? Yes, go on. You know what I'm going to say... If there is any love in the world, I love your daughter. Have you spoken to Lucy? No. Nor written? Never. I know what she means to you. I've waited as long as I could. I thank you for that. I know that to bring my love between you is almost a sacrilege. But I do love her. I know. Do not think I have any idea of taking her away from you. I, too, am an exile from France driven from home by my despair at the oppression of the people. I only ask to share your life and your name. You speak well, Charles Darnay. Tell me, do you think my daughter loves you? I do not know. Nor do I. And you want to go to her now with my knowledge? That and one promise. What promise do you want? Only that you will make her understand what I've told you that I never want to come between you. I believe you. I give the promise. Thank you, sir. There's one thing more. I think you ought to know my name. Your name? I've seen you looking at me strangely sometimes, as though you knew who I really was. I want you to know now. Stop. Do not say any more. But I want no secrets from you. No more, I say. Very well, sir. But there is a reason why I am in England. You should know it. And there is a reason why I am in England. I do not want to hear you. If you marry Lucy, you shall tell me after the marriage. Not before, Chaldani. I warn you, not before. Thus, one heart which dares to hope and so goes properly about its delicate mission. But there is another which does not hope and can afford to be more direct. I fear you are not well, Mr. Carpenter. May I get you some tea? The life I lead, Miss Manette, is not conducive to good health. Then why not change that life? It's too late for that. I shall never be any better than I am. Is there nothing I can do to help you? Nothing. Forgive me, Miss Manette, but will you hear what I want to say to you? If it will do you any good, dear friend, it would make me very glad. God bless you for your sweet compassion. Don't be afraid to hear me. I'm like one who died too young. All my life might have been. Oh, no, Mr. Carlton. I'm sure the best part of it might still be. If it had been possible, Miss Manette, that you could have returned the love of a drunken, wasted scoundrel. Please, you do yourself wrong. I know you can have no tenderness for me. I'm thankful that you don't love me. 
I could only have pulled you down to disgrace with me. I'm thankful that it cannot be. Can you understand that? If you... Forgive me. But if you love me, have I no power for good with you at all? None whatever. Let me say what I've come to say. You would have reclaimed me if anything could. You were the last beautiful dream of my misdirected soul. And is there nothing left of that dream? Nothing. I can live the rest of my poor life remembering that the last outpouring of my heart was to you. And that you could still find pity for me. God bless you. I'm not worth those tears. But will you believe one more thing? I will, Mr. Carson. Hold this in your mind sometime. Remember it for whatever it is worth. I shall never refer to this again. But I want you to know that for you, for anyone dear to you, I would do anything. Remember it, Miss Manette. There is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. Thus, life in Soho continues with some few differences. And in Paris, in the wine shop of Monsieur Defarge, Quarter Saint Antoine, matters also are not quite as usual. For three days there has been early drinking and late drinking, and the wine which is thin at the best of times must now be sour as well. For the faces of the drinkers are dark over the measure, but through it all, the proprietor's good wife, Madame Defarge, presides with her knitting, implacable. Not so her husband, who as the shop empties late on a hot night, shakes his head as though to clear away the foulness which is over all. The air is heavy tonight. Hmm. Yeah. You are fatigued. They are only the usual orders. I am tired. You were upstairs a long time with the three named Jack. How goes the matter? Long live the devil. You saw him who came in this morning? The mender of roads who lives near the Chateau de Vremont? Oui. Well? He came to tell us about Gaspard. He knew Gaspar? We saw him a year ago, and Gaspar's child was killed under every month's carriage, and he avenged it with a knife in every month's heart. But Gaspar's real name was not known. He was just called Jacques, as always. We, oui, but the police knew his description, so they looked for a man, not a name. And they got him. For a whole year. The pity of it. Bear him your pity. He has no more use for him. Dead? And lucky. The only home. I'll say you then. I say to be registered for destruction. The chateau and all the rest. It shall be done. Our comrades had some doubts about your manner of keeping the register of those who are doomed in your mission. I told them not to fear. My friends, they are my own stitches. My own symbols. They are plain as the sun to me and to no one else. They shall remain so. Ah, you have done well. You at least. Well, you are depressed. There is no reason. But, my dear... But, my dear... You are faint of heart tonight, my dear. Well, it is a long time. And when has it not been a long time? It is a rule. It does not take long to strike a man with lightning. But how long does it take to make the lightning? Tell me. A long time, I suppose. Aye. But when it is ready, it strikes. And everything goes to pieces before it. Meantime, it is preparing. That is your consolation. I would, I would as sure as you are. I tell thee it is on the road and coming. Look at the lives we know. Look at their faces. A bark and such things lost. It will come. You saw Jacques of the police today. What did he tell thee? There are more spies commissioned for San Antoine. Who are they? Only one that he knows for sure. Well, we shall register him. His name? Barsad. He is English. Hmm. 
So much the better. Christian name? John. Jean Barsad. Oui. Good. His appearance, is it known? Age about 40, height 5 feet 9, black hair, dark eyes, nose inclined to the left cheek. <laughs> better than a portrait. He shall be registered tomorrow. Uh, we may not have to wait so long. I'll say you. Look down the street under the lamp there. It is our man by my soul. He's coming here. Away with you, Defarge. Leave him to me. I'll stay near. Hand me my knitting. There. Let me stay long enough and I will have him down. I'll be off with you. Have a care, Terry. Hmm. Good evening, madam. Good evening, monsieur. A little glass of cognac, if you please, madam. At once, monsieur. Uh, you knit with great skill, madam. I am accustomed to it. A pretty pattern, too. You think so? Uh, Recordedly. Here is your wine. <sighs> you uh, have a husband, madam? I have. Uh, business is bad? Very bad. The people are so poor. Uh, the unfortunate people. So oppressed, too, as you say. As you say. Uh, of course. Uh, this uh, business of Gaspard's execution, what a pity. My faith, if a man must use a knife, let him pay for it. Yeah, but there's much sympathy for him in the neighborhood, is there not? Is there? Surely you must know Good that... evening, monsieur. Oh, good evening, Jacques. You deceive yourself, monsieur. My name is not Jacques. I am Ernest Defarge. It's all the same. Uh, well, I was just saying to madam, they, they tell me there's much sympathy in San Antoine for uh, poor Gaspard. I know nothing of it. You seem to know this Cartier better than I do. Oh, I'm so interested in the poor people. And by the by, monsieur Defarge, I know your name of old. Indeed? You were Dr. Manette's old servant. You had charge of him when he was released, didn't you? Why, uh... That is the fact, certainly. His, uh, daughter came here. And, uh, Nicole from Monsieur. As he called, uh, Rory of Telson's Bank. Such is the fact. Well, I've known them in England. Uh, you hear from them now? Not anymore. They have taken their road and we are. Oh, quite so. Well, Miss Manette is to be married. Hmm. Was pretty enough to have married long ago. Well, she is marrying now, and to a Frenchman, one Charles Darnay. Darnay? Well, that's not his real name. Oddly enough, he's a nephew of the very Marquis Saint Evrimont, for whom poor Gaspard was hung so wide. What do you say, the nephew? It is time to close the shop. You have finished your wine, monsieur? Assuredly. I bid you good night, madam, monsieur. I look forward to seeing you again. You gave too much away. Why did you show surprise? How could I help it? Can it be true? What he has said of Mademoiselle Manette. Since he said it, it is probably false. But it may be true. If it is. If it is? And if it does come, well, we live to see it triumph. What then, my friend? I hope for her sake, destiny will keep her husband out of France. His destiny will take him where he is to go. That is all I know. But is it not strange? Her father has been so dear to us. And now you are setting down her husband's name in your netting. His. And that infernal dog who just left here. Stranger things will happen when it does come. They are both here. And they are here for their merit. That is enough. This marriage is false. It is no concern of mine. Oh, no. <laughs> oh come now, Mr. Lorry. Once is enough to kiss the bride. Not such a lovely bride, is it? Oh, Carl, you are too flattering, dear Mr. Lorry. Nonsense. Lord bless me, weddings make a man think of all he's lost. You think there might have been a Mrs. Lorry. Oh. My friend, you were a bachelor in your cradle. Well, if so, I was very unhandsomely tempted. <laughs> very. Come now. What is she being a doctor and your husband? Well, they have been in Father's study for half an hour. I don't know what they can be talking about. 
It's time for us to go. Oh, a little good advice to young bridegrooms, most likely. Oh, Mr. Carter. Well, here they come at last. Our honeymoon couple will miss their ship, Doctor. Yes. Yes, it is time. Father, are you all right? You're sure you will be all right if I go? Of course, my darling. Laurie is right. You must leave now. You feel delayed. It's only for a few weeks, dear. Off with you now. We'll all be weeping like women. God, our treasure well, child. Never fear, Mr. Laurie. Come this see. Oh, Father. Uh, enough, my dear. Uh, take her shot. She's yours. Come, my darling. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, dear friend. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye, Lucy. Goodbye, Charles. Well, I think our Lucy will be a very happy woman, old friend. That's a fine young man. What did you say? I said Charles is a fine young man. Yes. Yes, a fine man. You look as though you could do with a drink, Doctor. Shall we three go and dine somewhere? Oh, an excellent plan. Uh, you, you must excuse me. I, I think I'm a little tired. I'd better stay here. Uh, some tea, then. Shall I ring for it? No, no, nothing. Do not trouble yourself. I go into my room and lie down. I shall be better, presently. I don't like this, Mr. Cardinal. Have you ever seen a man so pale? Not such a good idea of mine, that dining out. I only meant it to get his mind off of... Off of what? That's what I can't say. What think you? A fellow creature's mind is too deep a mystery for me, Mr. Carton. I'm a man of business. I... Listen. That's hammering. Quickly, Carton. Already we are too late. Dr. Burnett. Doctor. What is this? His old prison days. They are back on him. The shoemaking. Dr. Burnett. Look at me. Let me be. This shoe, it should have been finished long ago. Dear friend, you must stop this. Look at me. Do you know me? This shoe, I must work. But this is not your occupation. Do you know who you are? Think, my friend. I, number 105, North Tower... A few days of this mysterious return to suffering, and then the good doctor recovered, and the years wove happiness around the lives of the family in the corner of London, in the friendly, echoing street, in the house where there is sunlight. The storm clouds lower slowly. The gathering of the lightning consumes seven more years. Seven years. And then on a morning in July, San Antoine becomes a vast, dusky mass of scarecrows, heaving to and fro, of steel blades, muskets, and bayonets, of bloody fingers, unable to find another weapon, and setting themselves to force the very bricks from the walls. In the movement and the raging, one can perceive a center, a vortex, at a certain corner where stands a wine shop, and where Defarge labors with the strength of a man gone mad. Chuck three. I... Keep near to me. Chuck one and two. Uh... Separate. Hey. Lead as many patriots as you can. Where is my wife? Here you see me. Where do you go? I go with you, and my women follow. Yes, we can kill as well as men when the place is taken. Come then, patriots and friends. We are ready. To the Bastille! Deep ditches, double drawbridge, massive stone walls, eight great towers, cannon, muskets, fire and smoke, blazing torches, hard work and bravery, and the terrible sound of the living sea. Four fierce hours, and still the stone walls, the drawbridge, the great towers, and then... Look! The white flag! And Defarge of the wine shop is swept over the lower drawbridge past the stone walls in among the fallen towers. You there. Guard. Have pity, citizen. You want your miserable life? Uh, Kill the poor. Patience, shop three. You, show me the North Tower quick. I will. I will faithfully. But uh, there is no one there. What is the meaning of 105 North Tower? The meaning, monsieur? Does it mean a captive or a cell? Or do you mean I shall strike you dead? Oh, kill him, I say! Uh, monsieur, it is a cell. Show it to me and be quick, or your next breath is your last. Uh, 
this is the place. 105 North Tower. Uh, I cannot see a step into this door. Oh, here you. Pass that torch along the walls so I can see them. Oh, oui, monsieur. What do you find? Ah, look here, Jacques. Ah, letters A, M. Alexandre Manet. It must be. We must search this place. Give me your crowbar, Jacques. What are you going to do? The stool on the table. I'm going to smash them to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, rip open that bed and hunt through the straw, Jack. Hold a light fire for him, you. Try the chimney. I'm about to. What's in the bed? Now then, the half. Closer with the light there. I've a mind to make a chimney sweep out of you on this spot. Oh, here. Here, what's this? Uh, find anything? Here, in this crevice. Ah. I'll just keep this writing. Nothing in the wood and nothing in the straw, Jacques? Uh, nothing. Then set the torch to them. Quickly there. Oui, monsieur. Oui, monsieur. Oui, monsieur. La Bastille. You will burn. Let it burn high. And let all France burn with it. The torch is lighted and the flame sweeps. Here is this villain, the governor of the Bastille. What shall be done with him? Hang him up for a lamp. And so San Antoine has a new kind of lamp, a swinging sentinel to light its vengeance. Listen, everyone. There is news. What news, my husband? Does everyone recall old Foulon, who told us if we were hungry, we might eat grass? Foulon! He is among us. But he is dead. Not dead. They have found him alive. I have seen him. Shall he fear us? Foulon! And so an old sinner dies, choked by the grass he bespake so highly. Three years pass in which the flames of France climb high in their fury. And in London, in August of the year 1792, Telson and Company's bank is a place much changed. In the 150 years of its existence, it had prided itself on its quiet, its stuffiness, its manner of doing things in the slowest possible way. But in this year, when Monseigneur, lately of the nobility of France, Monseigneur, multiplied hundreds of times, finds himself no longer comfortable at home when he and his money are scattered far and wide. He must have a gathering place, and his headquarters in London is Telson's Bank. Monseigneur fills the rooms of Telson's, overflows its doors, and crowds around the shoulders of Mr. Jarvis Lorry. To his enormous inconvenience... In my 50 years with this bank, Mr. Darnay, I've never seen such a deal of custom as this. The French nobility have a fondness for Telson's, Mr. Lorry. This is where their money used to be. It quite fatigues me, all this hurry. Only half an hour left until closing, and I have so much to finish up. Uh, about this journey of yours, Mr. Lorry, again, I, I must suggest... That I am too old for it, eh? Travel is so uncertain. Paris may not even be safe for you. Oh, no one will interfere with an old man like me, Mr. Darnay. Uh, I know Telson's business in Paris better than anyone. It's necessary that I go. I wish I were going myself. And you, a Frenchman born, wishing you were going to France at this time? Well, I'm not going, and you are. And I must. All of our books and papers over there are in danger. It's impossible to get anything out of Paris past the barriers. These things must be seen to. And you really go tonight? Within the hour. Well, I admire your youthfulness. Uh, pardon, uh, Monsieur Laurie. Yes, Monsieur. What can I do for you? Have you found the man to whom that uh, letter is addressed? Not yet, Monsieur. Huh. Well, inform me if you do. I should be interested to see him. I've referred it to everyone here. No one knows the gentleman. Oh, what letter, Mr. Laurie? I have it here on my desk. Uh, here it is. Very urgent to Monsieur Yadavour, the Marquis Saint Evremont of France, to the care of Telson and Company, Bankers, London. I know the fellow. Huh. Uh, do you indeed, Monsieur? <laughs> uh, your pleasure, I'm sure. Will you take the letter, Charles? You know where to deliver it. I do. Please explain that it came here 
And we had no idea where to fall with it. I will do so. You start for Paris from here? From here. I, I will return to see you off. Very kind of you, sir. Oh, Monsieur, here to for the Marquis. For my long and faithful service as steward to your family, I, Gabelle, am now in danger of my life. So, Monsieur Laurie has found someone to deliver the letter, eh? Who is the man to whom it is addressed? Oh, the nephew of the polished Marquis who was uh, murdered. No? Huh. Happy to say I never knew the renegade. They tell me that my crime is treason against the people, since I acted Jealous. against them for you, an immigrant. I have explained to no avail that I have acted in their favor, not against them, according to your commands. They only say I have acted for an emigrant, and where is that emigrant? And so the clever nephew abandoned his post some years ago. Oh, infected with the new doctrines, I gather. Your post, the Marquis, abandoned the estates and left them to the Russians. Ah, most gracious monsieur, where is that emigrant? I cry in my sleep here in this prison. Where is he? And there is no answer. For the love of heaven... For the honor of your noble name, I pray you to come to my release. My fault is only that I have been true to you. Oh, Monsieur the Marquis, I pray you, be true to me. Well, Charles, I'm ready to go. Mr. Lorry, can't I persuade you? No more of that, my dear boy. Give my love to Lucy and the little girl. Take precious care of them until I come back. I'll try. Have you delivered that letter I gave you? I have. Uh, will you take back an answer? Yes. If it is not dangerous. Uh, not at all. Though it is to a prisoner in the Abbey. Uh, what is his name? Gabel. And what is the message to the unfortunate Gabel in prison? Simply this. He has received the letter. He will... He will come. <laughs> And drawn by the unseen force, Charles Darnay, unknown to anyone, left all that was dear on earth behind him and sailed away where the tide and the wind set strongly into the plain. Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens is one of the world's great novels brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company. Listen next week to the third episode of A Tale of Two Cities. And remember that there is a world of information and entertainment to be found in your local public library. To enhance your enjoyment of this series, we recommend the handbook of the world's great novels, which you may obtain by sending 25 cents to world's great novels, post office box 30, station J, New York 27, New York. That's Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27. A Tale of Two Cities is adapted for radio by Clarice A. Ross. The music was composed by Dick Shores, and the orchestra was directed by Bernard Berquist. The entire production was under the direction of Homer Heck. Geraldine Kay is featured as Lucy and Jonathan Hall at Sidney Carson. The narration is by Sherman Marks. Charles Darnay is played by Ken Nordine, Dr. Manette by Maurice Copeland, Defarge by Ken Griffin, Madame Defarge by René Rodier, Jarvis Laurie by Jess Pugh, and John Barsad by Ted Lip. Others were Donald Gallagher and Bob Smith. This is John Conrad. And this program comes to you from Chicago and is a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent station. This is, this is NBC. Chesterton Radio, your the home National for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton Day at Chesterton Radio. The world's com. great novels. <laughs> The NBC University of the Air presents the third episode in its four-part dramatization of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. 
another in a series of books that live the world's great novel. In the third year of the revolution in France, the year 1792, Charles Darnay, last descendant of the family of saint avremond so hated by the French Republic, has left his quiet home in England, his wife and their child, and set out for Paris, hoping to save a friend who is in danger and all unknowing of the peril in which he is placing his own life. The traveler fared but slowly on his way from England towards Paris in the autumn of the year 1792. For every town gate and village taxing house had its band of citizen patriots ready with muskets to stop all comers and goers, inspect their papers, send them on or stop them as their fancy deemed best for the good of the new republic of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. Charles Darnay had not gone far when he realized that for him there was no turning back along that road until he should have been declared a good citizen at Paris. And he admitted to himself that had he known of the difficulties, he might not have made the journey. Still, he had no fear of danger, even when at Beauvais he was forcibly provided with an escort of two patriots. And as the three rode on to Paris, he realized the seriousness of his situation only when they were stopped at the barriers of the city. Hold there, citizens! Not so quickly! Where are the papers of this prisoner? If you please, citizen. Well? I am no prisoner, but a free traveler. These men are my escort. Where are the papers of this prisoner? I have them, citizen. Voila. In my cap. Uh, here they are. Let me see. What? Charles Darnay. You are Charles Darnay? That is my name. You will dismount from your horse and come with me. Citizen, it is imperative. You will dismount from your horse and come with me. Uh. You two men may return to your village. Vive la République. Vive la République. Can you not see that my papers are in order? Follow me into the guard room. Uh. Whom have we here, citizen Duval? Marquis de saint Raymond, calling himself Charles Darnay. This is Evremont? This is the man. So, your age, Evremont. Thirty-seven. Married, Evremont? Yes. Where married? In England. Without doubt. Where is your wife, Evremont? In England. Without doubt. You are consigned, every morn to the prison of La Force. Prison? In the name of heaven, under what law? For what offense? We have new laws since you were here, every morn, and new offenses. But I have a right. Emigrants have no rights, every morn. Citizen of Hodge, you will see to this matter. I will see to it, citizen. Come with me, every morn. Vive la République. La République. This way. But this is impossible. Enough. Tell me one thing. Is it you who married the daughter of Dr. Manette, once a prisoner in the Bastille? Yes. But how did you... My name is Defarge. Oh. I keep a wine shop in the Cartier de Saint Antoine. You have heard of me? Defarge. Yes. My wife came to your house many years ago to find her father. In the name of this shop, female called La Guillotine... Why did you come to France? I hardly know now. I am lost here. Will you help me? No. Tell tell me one thing. When I am in prison, shall I be able to communicate with anyone? You will see. But I am not to be buried there. What then? Other people have been buried in worse prisons before now? But never by me, Citizen Depache. Please, it is important to me that one thing be done... There is a Mr. Lorry here in Paris with Kelton's bank. I only want him to know that I am in prison. Will you do that for me? I will do nothing for you, Evremont. My duty is to my country and the people. I am the sworn servant of them against you. No, I will do nothing for you. Voici, the prison of La Force.
What is this, citizen? You have not brought me another prisoner. The emigrant Evremund. What the devil? How many more of them? I leave him in your charge. Here are his papers. Ah, Take yes. them and be quiet. Farewell, Evremund. Papers, prisoners. Ah. In secret, too. As if there weren't enough. What is that? In secret? You will see. Come with me, emigrant. In here, every mound, with the rest of the <laughs> nobility. <laughs> See, my friend, a new companion in misfortune. I welcome you, good sir, to La Force. Thank you, monsieur. The Vicomte de Sèvres, at your command. May your calamity be a short one. It would be impertinence elsewhere, but may we ask your name and condition? Charles, Marquis de saint Evermore. Uh, Oh, again, welcome. But tell me, I hope you are not to be kept in secret. I have heard them say so. Ah, uh, we regret it. But sometimes it has not lasted long. I agree to inform all of you in secret. Come along, Evremond. No more of this. Our uh, good wishes, monsieur. No, well, monsieur. This is your cell. It means alone, then? In secret? Why am I to be alone? How do I know? I, I, I can buy pen and paper. Such are not my orders. You can buy your food and nothing more. Get in. Get in! Mr. Jarvis Laurie, having come to Paris to do his duty as he saw it in the service of Telson's Bank, found the violence which was so accepted there almost more than he could endure. He therefore stayed close to the bank, which occupied one wing of a building formerly the town palace of a great noble, whose servants had surrendered it eagerly to the uses of the Republic to absolve themselves from the sin of having drawn his high wages. Mr. Lorry even kept his lodgings in one of the bank's rooms, and the patriotic character of the rest of the building gave him a kind of security there. Still, when the nights fell, and he sat listening to the unearthly noises of the city, he would shiver and keep his blinds tightly closed and start whenever the great bell sounded at the gate. And it was thus his two visitors found him. Yes? Who's there? Lori. Thank heaven you are here. You have met. Lucy, what are you doing here? What's happened? Oh, my dear friend. It is my husband. It is Charles. Charles? What of Charles? I, I left him safe in London. He is here. Here? In Paris? He left London without telling me. Send me a letter after he was gone. We came as quickly as we could. Is anything wrong? Mr. Lorry, he is in prison. Great heavens. They arrested him at the barrier. How did you find this out? It was father. I was a Bastille prisoner, Lorry. Remember? It is a kind of charm now. We were stopped a long time. Poor little Lucy. She was so frightened. You haven't brought the child. She is here. And Miss Frost, too. Frost would not stay behind. We had to bring them. But that was madness. Mr. Lorry, 
Have you heard anything? Do you think he is safe? About Charles, I know nothing. Will you say that as if you... He must be calm, my dear. Nothing can be done tonight. I, I don't know what can be done. I know, my friend. There is not a patriot in France who does not love me for my old pain. You... You think you can help me? I am sure of it. My name got us past the barrier. My name will free Charles. What is that sound? It is coming from the courtyard. They are back again. Every hour, they're back. Lucy, come away from the window. Don't look out. Don't. I will. I must know. <gasps> Father! My dear, what is it? Nori, what are they doing? Oh, the oh, crowd and, and that grindstone. Well, you have seen it now. They come to sharpen the knife. The knife? They are murdering the prisoners. Oh, Charles. Doctor. <laughs> oh, no. If you're sure of what you say, if you really have some power, go down there. Have them take you to the prison. Which, which prison is it? La Force. La Force. <laughs> hurry, Manette, hurry. Yes, I will go at once. Keep Lucy here. Keep her safe. Lucy, my dear, come away from the window. No. No, I must look. If anything happens to Father. Courage, my dear. There he is. They are at the center of the crowd. They are listening to him. No, he is coming. He must be a prisoner. Help for his children. Help for every man. Leave him alone. He must be a prisoner. Leave him alone. They'll take him to the prison. There may be some hope. May heaven speed your father on his errand. No news yet, Frost. No one has come, Lady Bird. Oh, Father has been gone so long. A whole day and night. Frost, what is Charlotte? Now, Lady Bird, the doctor will keep him safe. I'd like to get my hands on some of those murdering patriots. I'd show them what an English woman can do. We must stay here in our lodgings. We must do as Mr. Lorry told us. I'm saying. I'm only saying what I'd like. Frost. Is little Lucy asleep? Ah, that she is, the little darling. <gasps> Mr. Lorry, dear friend, at last, is there any news? I have heard from your father. Yes? He thinks it best to stay at La Force a little longer. The child is safe. Oh, thank heaven. Is there... Has he been able to send me any word? There is a note. Monsieur Defarge brings it. He's gone to find his wife. They will be here directly. Monsieur Defarge? Remember, he was your father's old friend. It was a great favor that this note was allowed at all. Hush. I hear them coming. Oh, stay by me, Prof. I'll stay, Lady Bird. Though I don't know a word of this French jabbering. Here is my wife. Good citizen. Citizeness. You have word from my husband? Is this so? Here is the note. We have seen it. Yes. Dearest, courage, my father. Our child, it is true. He is safe. Oh, you were so kind to bring it. Let me kiss your hand to the Keep man. away. But oh, I... my dear. Madame Defarge has come to see you so that she may protect you. Protect me? Yes. There are frequent uprisings in the streets. Madame Defarge wishes to be able to identify you so that she may keep you from harm. I state the case, Citizen Defarge. It is so. Pros, you had better bring the child here. Uh, let the madame see her up. I'll bring her. But let that bold face put a hand on What her says the ugly one? Only that she will get the child. She has been with Dr. Manette in England for many years, and she knows no French. So, come then, my pretty. Only for a moment. Is that his child? Yes, madame. This is our poor prisoner's little daughter. It is enough, my husband. I have seen them. We may go. Citizen, at wait. Well? You... You will be good to my poor husband. You will help me to see him if you can. Your husband is not my business here. It is your father's daughter who is my business here. For my sake, then, be merciful. We are more afraid of you than anyone. Hmm. 
what uh, was it your husband said in that little letter? Did he not say something about influence? He said my father had much influence around him. Surely it will release your husband. Let it do so. But I beg you, do not use your power against my husband. Use it to help me. As a wife and mother, I beg you. The wives and mothers we have been used to see since we were as little as this child have not been greatly considered, eh, de No. We have known their husbands and fathers laid in prison and kept from them long enough. All our lives, we have seen wives and mothers and their children suffer poverty and oppression and neglect. Eh? We have seen nothing else. We have borne this a long time. Judge you then. It is not likely that the trouble of one wife and mother could be much to us now. And so in that strange world, more of the dead than of the living, there passed a year and three months. A year and three months in which, through all France, there was no pity, no peace, no pause in the relentless terror in which one hideous figure grew as familiar as though it had come into being with the foundations of the world, the figure of the sharp female called La Guillotine. But through the darkness of that time, Dr. Manette moved coolly, confidently, ministering to the hospitals and the prisons, a new strength in him born of his old suffering sustaining his belief that one day his power and influence would deliver the husband of his child. And through it all, Lucie carried on her household and cared for her daughter and kept her grief within herself. Except sometimes during the two hours of every day when she stood in a certain alleyway below the walls of the prison of La Force, where she could be seen by but could not see her husband. The alley was all vacant wall and emptiness, but for the hovel of a wood sawyer who kept himself busy and apparently noticed her, but rarely. Ah, ah. walking here again, citizeness? You see me, citizen? Yes, yes, forever walking, forever looking up at those brave walls of the fortress, eh? You mistake, citizen. May one not walk? Oh, indeed, indeed. <laughs> it is not my business. You, uh, you have a child with you sometimes. She is not here today? No. And the little citizeness walks too and looks up. Well, well, many can look in, many can go in, but few can come out, except to take the jolly ride in the little cart. <laughs> oh, she is a brave barber, our little thank you, teen. It is so? Hmm? Yes, brave. Oh, yes, yes, but she is not my business. My work is my business. My saw. I call it my little guillotine. Watch here. <laughs> and off comes his head. Oh, no. This is the firewood guillotine. Yes. See here again. <laughs> and off her head comes. And all the family. Oh, yes. <laughs> A brave barber. She will shave them all as quick as firewood. And vive la République. <laughs> this for a year and three months, while every night the list was read out at the prison, and those names said their farewells, and went the next day to their trials, and from thence to take their places in the tumbrils, bringing the sharp lady her daily ration. But at the end of that time... Lucy, I have news. What news, Father? I have received information. Charles is summoned for tomorrow. For tomorrow? He has not yet received the notice, but I am sure of it. Oh. Are you afraid? Yes. My poor child, you must trust in me. Oh, Father, I do. There is no time to lose. But I am well prepared. There is much to do. Father, if they should condemn me. They him. will not. He will be back with you in a few hours, Lucy. I will make sure of everything. Nothing can go wrong. Nothing. Oh, 
Charles Evremont, condamné. The public prosecutor will read the accusation. <laughs> Charles Evremont, condamné. Defused by the Republic as an immigrant, a friend to England, and an enemy of the people. His life is declared forfeit to the Republic. The people's decree having banished all immigrants on pain of death. Will you plead guilty, Evremont? No, please, the court, not guilty. Did you not live for many years in England, Evremont? I did. Then why are you not an immigrant? Because I left of my own free will, eh? To live by my own industry instead of by the industry of the people. But you married in England? I married a French woman. Her name and family? Lucy Manette. Only doctor at a good position, Dr. Manette. Truly, the doctor is a good man. Come on, but why did you not return to France before you did? I, I had no means of earning a living here. I returned only to save a friend, an old servant who was in danger. Is that criminal in the eyes of the Republic? No! no. 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 Where is that man? As the court knows, I was unable to rescue him. But there was a letter from him among my papers. I trusted it in the court's possession. It will prove what I have said. That will do, Evremont. All the witness, Alexandre Manette, physician. Poor Gapel. If he had lived, Doctor, I came to save him and he could save me today. I have seen to it that his letter is on the President's bench. Now, it is my turn. Yes. Doctor Manette, you have known the accused for many years. He was my first friend in England. He has always been devoted to my daughter and myself. What do you know of his friendship with the enemy English government? Eh? Friendship? He was tried for his life in England as its foe. Eh? Truly, this Evermond is not our enemy. No, I cannot be our enemy. You are sure of this fact, Doctor? Monsieur Laurie of Telson's Bank is here in the court. He will stand by me. He too was witness at the trial. Enough, citizen president. Yeah. Let the vote be counted. What is your vote then, citizen? Live, Charles, I can hardly believe you're really here. It's true, my darling, Anneli. Oh, so long. Such a terrible long time. And for me, when I had no one. Ah, but it is over now. Yes. Yes, it is over. Thanks be to God. I have thanked him, Father. I've thanked him on my knees as I prayed to him all the while. And you, Doctor, no other man on earth could have done what you did for me. For you, Charles, and for my child. She brought me back to life. If I had failed to save you for her, I would have been a poor creature indeed. And now, Father, now, may we not go home soon? I fear not, dearest. If we could get back to England, all of us, out of this terrible city... Uh, not yet, my child. It would not be safe for Charles to try to leave. Your father is right, Lucy. When we leave, it must not look like a flight. No, no, it would be very unsafe. We must stay here yet a while. But it is not safe here, either. I know it. If as anyone can be in Paris. After all, I was set free today. I am a good citizen now. Yes, Lucy. You saw how the people carried him home on their shoulders? There is no reason for them to change their mind? Perhaps not. And yet I am afraid. Lucy, dear, you have been so brave. I know, Father. But it is just that I have him back now. And yet there are so many, as innocent as he, who die every day. There is try not to think of it. Let us pretend we are at our own fireside in London. Oh, no, I cannot, Charles. There were no tumbrils rolling in London. Keep your courage up, dear heart. We shall be away before <gasps> long. What was that? I heard nothing. Who? Nor I. Oh, what a state you are in, my dear. You are startled by nothing at all. I 
I thought I heard French feet on the stairs. Well, if you did, you only hear Prost coming back from her marketing. She is a... Father, I tried to save him. My child, I have saved him. What, what weakness is this? Let me go to the door. <gasps> Who are you, citizen? What do you want? A citizen every month called Darnay. Who seeks him? We seek him. I know you every month. I saw you before the tribunal this morning. Well, I am every month. You are again the prisoner of the Republic. Charles! What is this? Why am I a prisoner again? It is enough that you return straight to the conciergerie. You are summoned for tomorrow. Citizen, you have said that you know him. Do you know me? We all know you, citizen doctor. Then tell me, how does this happen? He has been denounced to the section of San Antoine. San Antoine accuses him. Of what? Citizen doctor, you must be honored to make sacrifices to the Republic. Every month, we are pressed. Very well, I am coming. One word. Who denounces him? Uh, it is against the rule to tell. But he, he is denounced most gravely by the citizen and citizeness the Farge. So they have done this. And by one other. What other? I demand an answer. Then you shall have your answer, Dr. Manette. Tomorrow. A man may have his foot even past the door sill of freedom, but San Antoine has waited a long time. <laughs> Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens is one of the world's great novels. Brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company. Listen next week to the final episode of A Tale of Two Cities. And remember, there is a world of information and entertainment to be found in your local public library. To enhance your enjoyment of this series, we recommend the handbook of the world's great novels, which you may obtain by sending 25 cents to World's Great Novels, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. That's Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27. A Tale of Two Cities is adapted for radio by Clarice A. Ross. The music was composed by Dick Shores, and the orchestra was directed by Bernard Berkwitz. The entire production was under the direction of Homer Hex. Geraldine Kay is featured as Lucy, Maurice Copeland as Dr. Manette, and Ken Nordine as Charles Darnay. Jarvis Laurie is played by Jeff Pugh, Defarge by Ken Griffin, and Madame Defarge by René Rodier. The narration by Sherman Mark. Others were Hope Summers, Boris Aplon, Charles Mountain, Cliff Norton, and Les Spears. This is John Conrad. And this program comes to you from Chicago and is a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent station. A man may have his foot past the doorstep of freedom, but the hundred years following the French Revolution have shown us that freedom cannot be preserved by singing the Marseille or the Star Spangled Banner. Survival of our rights and freedoms requires that each of us carry out to his fullest ability his duties as a citizen. Freedom is everybody's business. This is NBC. This is Chesterton Radio, the, National the true, good, and beautiful at Chesterton Radio. The world's great novel. NBC University of the Air presents the fourth and final episode in its dramatization of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, another in its series of books that live the world's great novel. Charles Donnie imprisoned by the Republic for a year and three months after his return to France, was finally released after trial 
because of the influence and popularity of his father-in-law, Dr. Manette. But within a few hours, he has been arrested again to be held for trial the next day, denounced by people of the quarter of Saint Antoine in Paris. While Darnay, a free man for so short a time, counts the hours behind the gray walls of the conciergerie, while his wife Lucie and her father pray helplessly through the endless night, a new arrival on the scene sits with Mr. Jarvis Laurie in that gentleman's rooms above Telson's Bank, laying certain plans which may or may not be of use. I'm glad to see you here, Mr. Carton, but I still can't understand what you're doing in Paris. As I told you, Mr. Lorry, there was little to keep me in London. I came to be useful. Heaven grant you may be. Poor Charles. It is a cruel thing. Perhaps Dr. Manette will be able to help him again tomorrow as he did today. The trial is tomorrow, isn't it? I believe so. They're bragging in the streets that the little barber shaved off the heads of 63 today. Yes. No man's life is worth the purchase. I don't know if we can depend on the doctor for tomorrow. What then? I'm not sure, Mr. Lorry. I roamed the streets for a while this evening before I came to you. I happened on an old acquaintance. Someone who can help us? Not much. But if things go badly for Charles, he'll arrange for me to see Charles once. But that will not save him. I don't say it will. And there is nothing to be done. Nothing. Uh, Lucy. Lucy. Mr. Lorry, how does she look? Unhappy and very beautiful. Yes. Very beautiful. Yours is a long life to look back on, Mr. Lorry. Seventy-eight years. If you could say in your heart tonight, I have earned the love and respect of no one. I have done nothing good to be remembered by. Your 78 years would lie heavy on you, would they not? I think they would, Mr. Carton. But why should you think of this? You're young. Yes, I'm young. But my kind of youth doesn't lead to age. Enough of me. Where's my coat? Where are you going, Mr. Carton? Who knows? I shall be at the court in the morning. And may it be a happier day than this. Behind the lighted windows of Paris, people are going to rest. The streets are quiet. And in them, a tired and restless man walks to the beat of ancient words remembered dimly. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. is indicted as a suspicious and denounced enemy of the Republic, yeah. an aristocrat, and member of a family of tyrants. Yeah. By whom is the accused denounced? By three voices. Ernest Stefage, wine vendor of San Antoine. Yeah. Good. By Therese Stefage, his wife. Good. By Alexandre Monet, physician. Yeah. It's a fraud. The accused is the husband of my daughter. Oh, where is the man who says I did not feel? Your duty is to the Republic, Citizen Manet. Be silent and hear what follows. <laughs> I call the witness Renes Stefan. Renes Stefan! Renes Stefan! Citizen Defarge. You will tell the court what you know of the past history of the citizen, Dr. Manette. I was his servant long ago. I was only a boy when he was imprisoned. He was released in my care after 18 years. 
out of his mind and half dead. You did good service at the taking of the Bastille, citizen. I believe so. My husband was the best friend you there. Everyone knows it. Citizen Defarge, inform the tribunal what you did that day in the Bastille. I knew that the doctor had been kept in a cell number 105, North Tower. I examined that cell. I found a written paper hidden behind the stone in the chimney. Uh, here is the paper. It is in the writing of Dr. Manette. The public prosecutor will read the paper. I, Alexander Manette, unfortunate physician, write this in my cell in the Bastille during the last month of the year 1767. I write under every difficulty, hoping, hoping that some man may find it when I and my sorrows are dust. In the third week of December, in the year 1757, I was walking by the Seine on a cloudy night when a carriage passed me and stopped just ahead. By the time I came up with it, two men wrapped in cloaks had gotten out. You are Dr. Manette? I am. We have been to your residence and were told that you might be walking this way. Will you please enter the carriage? May I know who does the honor to seek me and what is the nature of the case? Your clients are people of condition. You will know the nature of the case when you see it. Will you enter the carriage? They were armed. I was not. I could do nothing but comply. We passed the North Barrier and came out on the country road and stopped at a solitary house where I perceived the men to be twin brothers. I was taken My to another husband. chamber where My I found father. a beautiful young My girl brother. tossing and My shrieking husband. in a high fever My of father. the brain. My brother. My husband. My father. My brother. How long has this lasted? This is our last night. She has a husband, a father, and a brother? She has a brother. You are not her brother? No, monsieur. I gave the girl a sedative and sat down by the side of the bed with the two brothers watching me. After perhaps half an hour, I was informed that there was another patient. One of the brothers led me back to a back room, a kind of loft. And I found there a young peasant boy dying of a wound. Monsieur, how has this been done? Crazy young dog. He forced my brother to draw on him. He fell by my brother's sword like a gentleman. Doctor? Yes, my boy? They are very proud, these nobles. They plunder us, beat us, kill us. But we have a little pride left, too. Have you seen her? Yes. My sister? She was a good girl, daughter. She was betrothed to a good man, too. A tenant of his. This man here. We were all tenants of his. She married. And in a few weeks, that man's brother saw her. He asked that she be lent to him. What do our marriages mean to them? They tried to persuade our husband to use his influence, to make her willing. Shall I tell you how? They harnessed him to a cart and drove him. They kept him in the swamps all night to quiet the frogs. It is among the rights of the nobles. But he was not persuaded. They took him out of his harness one day. And he died in her arms. Nothing could have held life in the boy but his determination to tell all his wrongs. He held back death with his clenched right hand, which covered his wound. They took my sister away. And my father's heart burst. There was no one left but my younger sister. I took her away, far away, where they'll never find her. And then I came here. I found a brother. Lift me up, doctor. Lift me up. Where is he? 
He is not here. Huh? But you are here, Marquis. You are here. In the days when these things are to be answered for, I summon you and yours to the last of your bad days to answer for them. I mock you with a cross of blood. His finger was raised for an instant, and then I laid him down, dead, and returned to my other patient, the girl. I repeated the medicines I had given her, and sat waiting there a day and a night, but I had no hope for her. Sometimes the Marquis would come into the room. Is she dead? Not yet. But she will die. Uh, doctor, when I found my brother in difficulty with these hands, I recommended you. You are a young man with your fortune to make. You know, of course, that these things are to be seen and not spoken of. Do you honor me with your attention, Doctor? In my profession, monsieur, the communications of patients are always held in confidence. My patient lingered for a week. I could not learn her name. She only shook her head on the pillow and kept her secret. At last, she died. The two brothers offered me money, which I refused, and I was taken back to my home. Wishing to relieve my mind, with little hope that the matter would ever be heard of, I determined to write a letter to the minister, telling him what I had seen. I delivered my letter to the minister, and that night a man rang at my gate. An urgent case in the Rue saint honore He had a coach in waiting, and it brought me here to this prison, to my grave. If it had pleased God to put it in the hearts of those two brothers, or this frightful year, to bring me any news of my dear wife, wife or my, my little Lucy. I might have thought that he had not quite abandoned them. But it is not so. And them and their descendants, to the last of their race, I, Alexander Manette, in my unbearable agony, denounce to the times when these things shall be answered for. I denounce them to heaven and to earth. I will tell the tribunal my secret. What I have hidden all these years. I was not born among the fishermen of the seashore, as my husband believed. I was carried there by my brother. I am that younger sister of that boy who was killed by every morning. <laughs> That boy was my brother. That girl was my sister. Those dead are my dead. They summoned to answer for those things. They sons to me. Answer the summons for me, citizen. Answer! <laughs> Oh, it's you, Mr. Lotter. Dr. Burnett, not back yet, Carton. No sign of him. What can he be doing until midnight? He had many people to go to. This absence is better than bad news. I fear the news will be bad no matter what he does. <sighs> Burnett, at last. Were you able to... Where is it? I must have it to... Where is it to... Oh, Where no. is it? My workbench. My shoes. What have they done with my work? What the... But then they don't all me. wonder he's lost his mind again mind. after today. That's the last chance gone. And not much of a chance at that. We'd better take him to Lucy. Yes, we'll have to. But first, I want you to promise me something, Mr. Lorry. What is it? You're not to ask any questions. Just listen. And promise to do as I say. Say your the pigs. Let me look in the doctor's coat. What have you done with them? Oh, yes. Here it is. Thank God. What is it? They're not here. Just a moment. Here. Take this certificate of mine. It's my pass to leave the city. Sydney Carton, Englishman. Keep it for me until tomorrow. Now, take this paper of Dr. Manette's. It's another pass for him and his daughter and her child, you see? Yes, yes. Put it away with mine and your own. 
It's good until it's recalled. What? It may be recalled at any moment. They're not in danger. They're in great danger. Madame Defarge is going to denounce them, too. What? How do you know? I went to the wine shop after the trial today. I pretended not to know any French. They didn't bother to keep still in front of me. I heard the words from Madame's own lips. Heaven save them. You will save them, Mr. Lorry. But how? I'm going to tell you. You have money. You can buy the quickest means of travel. Have your coach and horses ready to start at two in the afternoon tomorrow. It shall be done. Go to Lucy tonight. Tell her everything depends on her leaving Paris with you at the exact hour. Have the coach here in the courtyard. The moment I get there, take me in and drive away. I'm to wait for you under all circumstances. You have my certificate, remember? Keep my place in this field and then for England. Promise me that nothing will make you change this course. Nothing, Carton. Remember it tomorrow. Change or delay for any reason, and everything is lost. I shall not forget. I hope to do my part faithfully. And I hope to do mine, Mr. Lorry. And now, goodbye. Halls of Death, Sidney Carton walked with an old acquaintance. Donnie is in a cell alone, I hope, Mr. Barsett. Shh, don't use that name. You want me head to roll off? Better yours than many that will, Mr. Barsett. But you're right. I have need of you. Yeah, this business is risky enough as it is. I don't know why I agreed to it. You had no choice, as you'll remember. Your head would roll for certain were I to tell the Republic that you were once a paid spy of the English government. Enough of that, will you? I'm doing my part, ain't I? Here's the cell. Oh. Uh, go in alone. Now, remember, time is short. Yes. Who's there? I can see. Quiet, Arne. It's I, Sidney Cotton. Cotton? The last man on earth? You're not a prisoner. No, I have influence with one of the turnkeys. He brought me here. I bring a request from your wife. What is it? You have no time to ask me what it means. You must only do as I say. Uh, Take off your boots. My my boots? Yes, your boots. Take them Uh, off and put mine on. But, Carter... Hurry! (laughs) Now, the cravat. Come along. Carter, there's no escape from this place. He will only die with me. Have I asked you to escape? Take my... Take my coat and give me yours. This is madness. Do I ask you to pass the door? Now, shake your hair out as mine is. Carton, others have tried. It has always failed. I implore you. There are pen and paper on the table. Is your hand steady enough to write? It was when you came in. Quick, then. Write as I dictate. Hurry, my friend. All right, I'm... If you will remember... If you will remember... The words that passed between us long ago. You will understand this. When you see it, you do remember them, I know. It is not in your nature to forget. I am... Why are you stopping? Have you written to forget? Yes. Uh, is that a weapon in your hand? Well, no, no, I am not armed. What is that in your hand? That cross? You shall know in a moment. Right on. I am thankful that the time has come when I can prove them. That I do so is no subject for regret or grief. What uh, vapor is that? Vapor? Something that crossed my face. Nothing, nothing. Take up the pen and finish. Hurry! Right! If I had done otherwise than I now do, I should but have had so much the more to answer for. Have you got that? Yes, yes, Carson. I can write no more. My, my head, Carson... God, quiet. Quiet now, will you? Let, let go. Let go. So. You out there. Enter. Come quickly. You put him out for sure. Now look at the two of us. Do you think you're taking any risk? There's no risk. Now get help and take me to the coach. Take you? Him, man. Him I've exchanged with. Call help quickly. Oh, we will then. Help here. Come, lend a hand. You won't betray me. Haven't I sworn vows enough? 
take him to the courtyard of Telson's. Put him in the carriage and tell Mr. Lorry to remember his promise. That's all. The ball is coming. Oh, no. Ah, what has happened to this one? Yeah, we spend every morning throwing a prize in the lottery of St. Guillotine. So it affects him. Ah, is that like a good patriot? Yeah, the good patriot needs fresh air. Let's get him out. Well, there. Uh, your corpse, did you say? The uh, time is short, every morning. The hour is three. I know it well. Be careful of my friend and leave me. I forget what you were accused of. Plot. Is it likely? Oh, a plot with a little thing like me. I have done nothing, citizen. I know. I am not afraid to die. If only the Republic would profit by my death, but how can that be? I don't know, my dear. If I ride with you, citizen Evremont, will you let me hold your hand? Of course. Thank you. It will give me courage. You... Oh, are you... You are not... Hush. You... You are dying for him. Hush. Yes. You will let me hold your hand. Boy, stranger. Yes, my poor sister. To the last. There is the sound of the rolling tumbrils, and every rumbling turn of the wheels is another second gone, another foot closer to death, through the throngs of the populace who have come to watch death do his work. And in the front row of the throng, in the seat she always occupies, Madame Defarge's knitting is waiting for her. But Madame Defarge is elsewhere employed. She stands in rooms but lately emptied in flight by certain enemies of the Republic whom she is preparing to denounce. She stands facing a woman as stern as she, and though neither can understand the other's speech, each can see clearly enough into the other's heart. The wife of Evrimon, where is she? You shall not get the better of me, madame. I am an English woman. You are the one called Pross. You are only a servant. My business is not with you. I'll keep you standing there a while. Depend on it. It will do her no good to hide. Go tell her that I wish to see her. At once, do you hear? The longer I keep you here, the farther away my ladybird is getting. I'll not leave a hair on your head if you lay finger on me. You this. poor wretch. What are you worth? Citizen doctor. Wife of every moon. Child of every moon. Anyone but this miserable fool... Answer the citizen Estefage. Call as loud as you will, madame. Call away. Let me look in that room behind you. Keep back. If they're gone, they can be brought back. As long as I can keep you here. I'll tear you to pieces. But I'll have you from that door. Heaven, give me strength. Give me a you English fool. I'm stronger I than you. Bless heaven. I can hold you. Come here. If I get the gun, I will one of them die. I win one of them. If I get And the smoke cleared and passed out on the air in the stillness with the soul of the furious Madame Defarge, who lay lifeless on the ground. Don't be afraid. Oh, it's me. 
I ask you one question? It's fabulous. Tell me what it is. I have a cousin who may love dearly. She lives in this old couple. She knows nothing at all like this. It is better so. Uh, I have been thinking. If the wife had become good for the poor, if they are not hungry anymore, she may live a long time. My what then, gentle sister? Do you think it will be long while I wait for her in heaven? It cannot be. There is no time there and no trouble. This time. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens is one of the world's great novels, brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company. Listen next week to a special Christmas presentation of the radio play, A Child is Born, by Stephen Vincent Benet. To enhance your enjoyment of this series, we recommend the handbook of the world's great novels, which you may obtain by sending 25 cents to world's great novels, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. That's Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27. A Tale of Two Cities was adapted for radio by Clarice A. Ross. The music was composed by Dick Shores, and the orchestra was directed by Bernard Berquist. The entire production was under the direction of Homer Heck. Jonathan Hall was featured as Sidney Carton, the role of Dr. Manette was played by Maurice Copeland. Charles Darnay by Ken Nordine. Defarge by Ken Griffin. Madame Defarge by René Rodier. Frost by Hope Summers. Laurie by Jess Pugh. The Marquis by Sid Breeze. The Peasant Boy by Charles Mountain. The Seamstress by Martha McCain. Barsad by Ted Liss. The Peasant Girl by Geraldine Kay. The President of the Court by Boris Eplon. And the Narration by Sherman Marks. This is John Conrad. This program comes to you from Chicago and is a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent station. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. This is Chestertonradio.com.